Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Lori Johnson. And I'm Mark Martin. Iranian prison guards holding American pastor Saeed Abedini have reportedly given him a warning. Deny Jesus Christ and return to Islam or stay in prison for life. Lawyers representing the 35-year-old Abedini say he's also facing increased psychological torment. George Thomas has the details. Saeed Abedini was convicted on January 27, 2013 and condemned to eight years in prison. Now Iranian authorities are threatening to extend that prison sentence, something his lawyers say has been done to other Christian prisoners in the past. They find some other way to set them up for a falsehood and try them for an additional conviction. According to Abedini's wife, Nagme, prison guards have become increasingly hostile, reportedly tormenting the 35-year-old American pastor with constant psychological threats. In a Facebook post, Nagme writes, he has been under a lot of pressure and attack from the hardliners. The guards have also been threatening Saeed that he will never go free. They continually threaten Saeed that the only key to his freedom is denying Christ and returning to Islam. Abedini is serving his sentence in one of the toughest prisons in Iran. This is a prison that was built for 5,000 individuals, currently housing over 20,000. So you've got incredible hygienic conditions. You've got threats from other cellmates. Certainly several of them see him as a threat right now as Iran and the United States are negotiating this nuclear deal. Nagme says recent prisoner executions have also taken their toll on her husband. Despite the hardships, she writes that he continues to remain strong in the faith. He wants you all to know that the Lord continues to move in that prison and lives are being transformed. They had a great Easter in prison. Saeed desperately missed being with our family on Easter, but new Easter traditions were created in prison. Over the years, this journey has truly become more difficult and painful for Saeed and for the kids and I. Our family appreciates your continued prayers. George Thomas, CBN News. In Pakistan, an American woman is fighting for her life after being shot in the head during an apparent terrorist attack. Karachi police say 55-year-old Deborah Lobo was shot twice by at least two men on motorbikes as she was leaving the medical school where she works. Authorities believe this was a pre-planned terror attack and say Lobo was targeted because she's an American. The gunman escaped. Lobo's father tells the Washington Post she moved to Pakistan 30 years ago to work as a Christian Christian missionary. He also told the Post Lobo is married and has two teenage daughters. Italian authorities have arrested 15 Muslims for allegedly throwing 12 Christians overboard a migrant boat traveling from Africa to Italy this week. Police learned about the incident while interviewing survivors from Nigeria and Ghana Wednesday morning after being rescued at sea. The survivors said they boarded a rubber boat April 14th on the Libyan coast with 105 passengers aboard. During the crossing, the Christian migrants were thrown overboard by about 15 Muslim passengers because of their faith. An Ohio man appears in court today on terrorism charges. He was apparently plotting an attack on a U.S. military base. 23-year-old Abdurrahman Sheikh Mohammed is from Somalia, but became a U.S. citizen last year and was living in Columbus, Ohio. Authorities say he recently traveled to Syria, where he joined an al-Qaeda affiliate and was training in weapons, explosives, and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Christian businesses in Indiana are facing tough choices after the recent firestorm over the state's religious freedom law. Media scrutiny over that law may have died down, but Christian business owners are trying to figure out, will they be forced to choose between their faith or their livelihood? David Brody brings us that story from Indianapolis. Walk into a business these days in Indiana and you may see these welcoming signs about serving everyone, but don't be misled. This isn't just famous Hoosier hospitality on display, it's a show of support against the religious freedom law that gay activists felt was discriminatory. Well, we never really thought this law was going to be that controversial. Micah Clark played a major role in the original law's passage, which was intended to provide additional religious liberty legal protections to those who were sued. He says the updated version add sexual orientation protection beyond anything provided by the state. That means Christian businesses may not be able to use this new Religious Freedom Reformation Act known as RIFRA. 
Yeah, it's not only going to be harder in certain places, you won't even be allowed to use RIFRA in certain able. places. They've basically taken a map of Indiana and cut parts out of it where cities have these ordinances and said RIFRA cannot apply in these cases. What's the end game then for the gay and lesbian? Uh, they, they simply want to put sexual orientation and gender identity in our civil rights code as if sexual behavior is the same as a benign genetic trait like skin color. I don't see sexual behavior that way. The controversial Indiana law written right here at the State House in Indianapolis has a lot of Christian business owners wondering what their next move is going to be as they try to navigate the worlds of discrimination and religious liberty. We don't want to discriminate anybody. Casey Sampson and his Christian family own a leather shop north of Indianapolis. He's not quite sure what to expect under the new law. One thing's for sure though, he's not going to sacrifice his Christian beliefs. I don't want to put something that specifically is contrary to my belief because I have to hand make that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, when I'm stamping into this belt that God is great and then somebody else wants to come in and, you know, said Satan is great, that's that's going to hurt me. You that's know, personal. For it's you. very personal. But now, if Casey says no, this religious liberty law may not give him further protections in court if he's sued. For a family-owned business, this could be potentially very detrimental to this business. You know, potentially, it, if a lawsuit starts. It, it could. If a lawsuit came up and, and the court ru ruled against our favor, uh, it would devastate our family business. This whole situation has made the family rethink how they do business. We've honestly put a lot of thought into not doing any custom orders anymore. Uh, and and that, that'll that hurt business. Indiana's reputation has taken a hit as well. It's gotten so much bad press that the state's economic and tourism agency hired a PR firm this week to encourage businesses to come back to Indiana. Right now, the only known commodity is frustration on both sides of this hotly contested issue. David Brody, CBN News, in Indianapolis, Indiana. GOP presidential candidate Rand Paul told a pro-life audience Thursday that liberty can only be protective, protected is if we first start with protecting the basic right to life. Paul was greeted enthusiastically by supporters of the Susan B. Anthony List, an influential pro-life policy group in Washington. Paul only explained why his pro-life views match up with his libertarian-leaning philosophy. Now, some have said to me, they say, well, you're big on all this liberty stuff. Why do you want to restrict a woman's right to choose? And I said, well, you know what? The government does have some role in our lives. The government, one of the main roles that government has is to restrict you from harming another individual, which gets us back to the original debate. When life begins, there is a role for state. So it's not that I'm against people choosing things. I'm, in fact, one of the biggest believers in choice, in liberty. But you can't have liberty if you don't protect where your liberty originates from, and that's your right to life. A few other potential presidential candidates appeared at the summit as well, including Carly Fiorina and Sen Senator Lindsey Graham. A move to make the Bible the official state book of Tennessee passed in the House, but not in the Senate. I think the, the Senate sponsor of the Bible bill has said, well, that's just one man's opinion. Well, uh, how important is it? How accurate is it? Needs to be discussed. The bill has divided Republicans in the state. Some say the Bible is too sacred to be a state symbol. Others argue it's an integral part of the state's history. A statue of the Reverend Billy Graham could be placed inside the U.S. Capitol. The North Carolina House approved a bill Thursday which officially asks a congressional committee to approve the step. Each state is allowed two statues in the Capitol building. Billy Graham's would replace one of a more controversial former governor, Charles Aycock. The measure passed 71 to 28 with all the negative votes from Democrats. It has been one week since a devastating EF4 tornado struck Illinois, and Operation Blessing volunteers are still helping and encouraging victims in the town of Rochelle. Thursday, another 113 volunteers removed debris, cut fallen trees, and helped residents salvage personal belongings. Since last Saturday, Operation Blessing has dispatched over 1,600 volunteers to the site, and they are expecting another 400 to 500 volunteers Saturday for their last working day.
coming up, never again, how one Holocaust victim is using her art and her amazing story of survival to keep the truth alive. This week, Israelis marked 70 years since the liberation of the Auschwitz death camp. Of those who survived the Holocaust, around 200,000 now live in Israel. CBN's Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell has one of one tells the story of one of them. This painting is a recent one. I, I named it uh, uh, "The Wounded Survivor." Rita Kazimel Brown was seven years old when the Nazis invaded her hometown of Termot in Poland. In 1941, Nazis rounded up the Jews there and put them in a ghetto. Rita is now a recognized Holocaust artist who has worked as an art therapist. Her survival experience is the theme of many of her paintings. I'm the wounded survivor. I always uh, painted myself in white. I think it uh, has to do with not so white nightgown that I survived the whole Holocaust in. At 80, Rita okay. is bubbly and vibrant. Okay. If not for her artwork and her story, you might never know her painful past. Yet she carries her memories with her every day. I'm not sure if it's totally that you cannot heal the wound. It's something that's, that still works in your memory and it affects your daily life. Her story is told in the book, Portrait of a Holocaust Child, Memories and Reflections. Rita told CBN News how she and her family escaped the ghetto and survived in what they called the grub. And my father went away for a few, for a few days and what he did, he found another Christian family in a little town called Malaki. And there he dug a big pit under the stable and it had a connection to the potato bin and a ledge you can open to the, to the farmer's uh, uh, home. My father and uh, my mother and the two little kids were with, her, with them and only my little brother could stand up. And I was lying in the passageway from the pit to the potato bin. This is how we lived 20 months. We were hungry and fearful, and uh, it was just a living hell. It was, we called it, uh, it was a living grave. Being awake was a nightmare, she said, hour by hour, suffering day and night. Most of her father's 12 siblings died, where her little family of five stayed alive. Being creative helped me survive, but not only survive, but keep my sanity. In 2006, Rita revisited Poland for the first time to join the March of the Living. While there at Auschwitz, a spider bite took special significance. And there is this black spider that bit me, and it looks a little bit like a swastika. Yeah. And it's also soaked with blood. A mother of two and grandmother of three, she's seen many miracles in her life. We have kind of a, a survival instinct which was very strong, but now it's weakening because when you get older, your, your defenses go down. And so the only thing that we have is because of our children and grandchildren. That's our victory. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Up next, they stand firm for God in everything they do. Meet the Robertsons of Duck Dynasty and see how their Christian faith shines through in their latest family project. Duck Dynasty has been one of the most successful reality shows in TV history. And now the family behind the phenomenon is launching out with a new project. The Duck Commander musical kicked off this week in Las Vegas, and the Robertson family has been having some fun with the whole idea of it. They're going to make a musical about the Robertsons? I am fired up. Look, I'm telling you, this is crazy. I wonder who's going to play me. Crazy. I wish Liz Taylor was still alive. I love musicals, and I cannot believe there's going to be a musical about our family. Evidently, this is going to be some kind of train wreck. I told you it was insane. It's time to get your duck on. You <laughs> Get your duck on. Well, funny stuff. Recently, I spoke with Willie and Corey Robertson for more about their new musical. Take a look. When most people think about Rednecks, musicals aren't the first thing that comes to mind. How did this idea for a musical <laughs> come about? <laughs> Well, we um, actually wrote a book called The Duck Commander Family right after Duck Dynasty came about. And 
the um, our agent in New York, that's a theater agent, came to us and said, I think your family story has what it takes to become a musical. And um, yeah, we, once we got over our shock and Willie realized that he wasn't actually going to have to be up there singing and dancing. <laughs> he actually thought that at first, but once he got over that, um, we you know, thought about it and she said, you know, it's a story of American dream. It's a family that's stuck together through good times and bad. It's a story of a family that has um, relied on their faith to get them through really difficult times. And um, here we are in Vegas with a musical. That's wonderful. Well, tell us about the story and the songs. How much of a role did you have in creating the musical? Well, we had uh, uh, a lot to do with it. We, we've been working on this, like Corey said, for two years we've been sitting down with the writers back when it was just an idea, and then we heard our first couple of songs, and then, uh, and then we thought, well, um, this is starting to sound pretty good. Uh, it's, it's actually good, and the stories have meaning and heart. You know, I think this musical has heart, and and so uh, and you'll see this played out, and, and they're fun too. It's like it's kind of like the show in a way where it's fun. I mean, it's funny, and you'll do you'll you'll have those moments, but then there's also these deep, heavy moments. I mean, going all the way back to Phil and Kay's life and their marriage. Whenever you know there was these you know forks in the road, and and they could have went a different way, and none of this would have been here today. And so uh, uh, we had a lot of involvement in with it and the direction, especially the tone and how it went. How much coaching did you give the actors to help them portray you guys as you really are? <laughs> A little bit. I think it's really it's about them just coming to be with us. We invited them to Louisiana and they spent a weekend with us eating crawfish and frog legs and just hanging out with our families. And uh, we could tell they were kind of studying us, trying to see, catch our mannerisms and see um, how we say certain things. And, you know, we've just gotten to be a big family. We love all the actors. We love the crew, the whole, the producers, the director, the set designer. It's just been an incredible experience. Let's talk about Uncle Cy a little bit. He's a scene stealer at times in your TV show. Mm -hmm. What about the play? Well, leave it to Uncle Cy to, to steal the show again. And uh, he certainly does that in this one. He's got some really funny lines that he has. And uh, the guy that's playing him is just a, he's quirky himself. And so he, he reminds me a lot of Cy. And so, um, there's a, you know, kind of when, when the show came out, the television show came out, it kind of, there was this weird phenomenon that went on that a lot of ladies liked Cy and they would send him marriage proposals. And Cy's been married for 40 years. And so I, for some reason, they thought he was single because they didn't see his wife on the show. So he starts getting all this stuff and we deal with that in the musical. And uh, he has a song called Ladies Man that, um, uh, let's just say it ends a uh, uh, very... Um, Saturday Night Feverish, and uh, <laughs> it's pretty funny. You just got to see it. <laughs> well, I know your family's Christian faith is a big part of your lives. Talk about how it's portrayed in the musical. Well, it is a big part of our lives. It is, you know, the most important things in our lives. And so in everything we do, from the TV show to our books to the musical, um, we want that to be first and foremost. And so the very first song is called Faith, Food, and Family, and um, it starts out you know, talking about what's important to our family. And um, and you see it all the way through within the decisions we make and when we go to God in prayer throughout all of it. It's not, the musical is not preachy at all. It's not, you know, trying to um, really teach anybody anything necessarily. It's just kind of showing our lives and how we live them. And hopefully we give glory and honor to God in all that we do and the decisions we make and the way we live our lives and the way we try to shine our light. And um, I think that comes through in the musical. Showing who you really are and what Jesus means to you. Well, what's something the audience may be surprised to learn about the Robertsons? Well, I think uh, probably the thing that they'll be surprised is that we actually dealt with some of the controversial things that have happened since our television show came out. Uh, some things that Phil said, um, you know, we dealt with them right there on the stage. And, uh, you know, the musical is put together by a lot of different people and people from all different walks of life. And so we just dealt with it right there. And we said, hey, let's just go ahead and put it in there. It's a, it tells its story. It's very dramatic. And uh, that's when the family gets tested. And really, you're looking at it and it could all go away tomorrow. And so we were kind of at that another fork in the road that, uh, that we had to figure out which way. And we said, hey, we're sticking with God. And, uh, and it's worked out. All right. Willie and Corey Robertson of Duck Dynasty. Thank you so much for your time, and we really appreciate your witness. We said a prayer for you guys before, before the interview. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Well, it's Friday, so that means it's time for our regular family-friendly movie reviews with Bob Walaszewski. He's with Focus on the Family's entertainment review department called Plugged In Online. Okay, Bob, so let's start with Monkey Kingdom. I hear it has some great acting. <laughs> no, seriously, though. <laughs> yeah, Tell you, us don't about have, you don't have to pay these guys. Slip <laughs> them a, uh, an egg or a banana every once in a while, and they're way happy. <laughs> Cheap help. Tell us Cheap about help. that movie. Um, I've been a fan of all seven of the previous Disney nature films. This year, Monkey Kingdom, as you mentioned, and it follows a troop of toke macaques, an endangered uh, type of monkey, as specifically we're looking at uh, the world in Sri Lanka. And they concentrate on a young female named Maya and her just gave birth to son Kip as they forage in the jungle, uh, go and live in a very strict uh, pecking order society among monkeys. Didn't know that, uh, but learned that by watching this and uh, and how they're trying to survive and along with the other monkeys. Gave it a four and a half out of five. Mm -hmm. Lori knocked it down a half a point and parents need to keep in mind, especially with younger kids, that there are two monkeys that don't survive here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's a deal killer at all or it wouldn't have gotten that higher uh, rating, but parents need to know going in, uh, especially with younger kids, Kids, that they are they need to talk through you know mom what happened there you know right so. all right so Bob if someone in our audience wants to see a film this weekend and monkey kingdom isn't quite what they had in mind is there anything else they might want to consider you know I, I um, I'm a big fan of woman in gold um, it, it just was a story that resonated with me. I, uh, we gave it a three and a half there's a bit of harsh profanity I want to warn people about at the very end of the film but a tremendous story. Um, I like Cinderella, a uh, home uh, for the Dollar Theater, McFarland, USA. And Do You Believe is playing across the country in some big theaters, main theaters, and also in some dollar theaters. So people who haven't seen Do You Believe, it might be a good weekend uh, to go catch that one. All right, I saw Cinderella and I agree. I thought it was wonderful. The costumes are fantastic. And the emphasis on being kind and courageous. This one added those two virtues in a, I thought, a pretty powerful way. Exactly. It really didn't focus on Cinderella's beauty, but her character and her integrity instead. All right, Bob, great information. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you again okay. next time. Sounds good, Lori. That's going to do it. Have a great weekend.